to present on this topic today. We have a fine crowd today. I'm just so happy to see each and every one of you. And um, thank, I thank Pastor Murray and Pastor Joanna for entrusting me uh, to speak to you all this morning and share with you guys, encourage you. I've been so excited about this weekend. Mr. Nikki, you did an awesome job. You were so inspired. Generation owning a torch. How many of you guys have seen the Olympics on TV? Yeah. Seen the Olympics? Okay. So when I think of a torch, I think of the Olympics. You know, they take the, cor the torch, they, they have the torch, they go all around the country, they may go from one country to another, and they travel around with this torch and they uh, light it at the start of the ceremony. You know, they have the big festival and everything. So as I began to kind of pray about uh, what God would have me to say to you regarding being a generation owning the torch, I had that visual. So when we think of a, um, a torch, I automatically just start to think Olympics and, you know, who's at the Olympics? The best, right? The top. The top people are there. The whole world is watching. All eyes are on those people, right? And that's what I, I just felt led to relate this to because even though they're the people carrying the torch, I wanted to talk to you guys about owning the torch and being a generation that owns the torch. So, you know, in the Olympics, I don't know if you know this, I had to do a little research, but when they carry the torch, you know, that's a high honor. That's, that's something that's a big deal. That's a huge deal to be entrusted or selected to carry a torch. And you have this torch, and you're going, they're going all over the country. I looked at a map. And I looked at the 2004 Olympics when they had them here. Okay, they light the torch in Greece. They travel overseas. They had people on the boat with the torch. And a speedboat. I'm like, oh, okay, that's different. But you know what? While they're on that journey, they're entrusted to keep that torch lit. So they have backup. Uh, flames, they have special stuff that it can withstand rain and wind as they're traveling. And they travel all the way from Greece. Yeah, you didn't know this, did you? Y'all were watching. You should watch it next time when they, because they do a whole coverage of it. So they go from Greece, and then they go to the U.S., and when they got to the U.S., they were all over the country. I said, but it was just in Atlanta. Why did they go all over the, all over the country? Isn't that kind of weird? Well, that's a lot. That's a bit much. But you know what? They're doing it because as you carry the torch, people watch you carry the torch. And they have crowds of people watching them carrying the torch. So you have people watching as you're carrying the torch. All eyes are on you. So even though they could have took the short journey from Greece to Atlanta, they went all over the country, big zigzags, so people can see them carrying the torch. So. One of the things I'm going to speak to you guys on later on is being visible. God places you in places to be visible so other people can see you doing something for God. They can be able to watch you. And when they watch you, they get motivated. They get encouraged because they see you with a light. They see you with something extra that you're carrying. And when you see people do that, it's inspiring. You guys, just think of some of your role models. I know my um, Sunday school youth girls class, we talked about that recently. We were like, who, who are your role models? Who do you look at and say, ooh, I want to be like that, and why? So when we just think about that, get a person in your head, that you're like, man, if I could be like that, or if I could do something that they're doing, or if I could reach people the way they're reaching people, 
And then these people have certain traits. So we're going to talk about that. So before we do, I wanted to kind of talk about some other people in the Bible who, how should I put it? We're going to talk about three generations. And I believe they're going to pass out a handout. And what we can do, we have a lot of people, so um, we'll have to kind of divvy up. So Micah, you can, you can do two, and then just like every few groups, two, okay? And while she's passing that out, I'm going to need, let's see, five volunteers. Oh, look, really? yeah. I knew you were going to volunteer. <laughs> Got one, Jane. Okay. What's your name, Monte. I remember you. We were talking the other day. Monte, I got it. Okay, I got two. Genesis. Oh, I need two big. Um, Trinity. And um, Amira. We'll have you all. Let's see. I don't need any more. We might do another group later on, but we'll stick with those five. So I want you guys to stand up for me and just come up here. Come on up front. All right. I'm going to blindfold RJ. I'm going to do a little demonstration. I think RJ loves this too much. RJ can't see anything. So, this is what we're going to do. I want, I want you, Monte, I want you to stand all the way near that window, all the way against the wall. And I want you three, you're going to be some obstacles, okay? So your obstacle number one, obstacle number two, your obstacle number three. All right? One, two, three. So when we when I'm, I'm going to talk about three generations in the Bible, we're going to use several different Bible stories. A lot of you guys know them, but part of being a generation uh, owning a torch, you have to know where you're going. You have to have the people to help you and guide you, and you have to be receptive to that. Now, a lot of times when we try to do it on our own, and we're trying to get somewhere and we can't see what, what's ahead, and we don't have people helping us, we can't get to where we're going if we can't see it. You can't get to where you're going if you don't have help. Because if you can't see where you're going, you have no vision, you have no direction, you're lost. Mm. So, RJ, I'm going to help you out a little bit. Use your Holy Ghost senses, son. <laughs> <laughs> Holy Ghost senses. I want, I'm going to tell you when to walk, but I want you to walk straight, okay? And Imante is waiting for you. You guys are going to be my obstacles. One, two, three. Don't let RJ get through. You're here to stop him, okay? RJ, I'm going to give you my phone now. Okay. Act like this phone is worth $2,000. Oh, my. Oh, look, he did like this. It's $2,000. i got to keep this. I'm not letting this go. This is valuable. This is something special. Uh-oh, I got to keep this. All right, RJ, only thing you have to do, you got to make it over to Imante. Now, you're just going to walk, and you have some obstacles, but I'm not going to help you. You don't have me here. You, you know what, RJ, you don't have me here because you don't want to listen. So I'm going to stand right over here and let you try to get over there, wherever you're going, over yonder on your own. Go ahead. Obstacles, y'all not supposed to let him go. RJ, you got it. You're trying to get there. You got to be a little more aggressive. Hit, try to get there. Y'all, try to take the phone. Take the phone from us. Take the phone. They don't take your two thousand dollars. Amante, Amante, watching you. He's like, man, come on, come on, come on. Whoa, 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 whoa. RJ, go. Okay, I'm going to unblock him. He didn't 
get there. He couldn't see. He didn't have anyone guiding him. I didn't give him any direction. You all can have a seat. We'll do it again later. He didn't have any direction. He had stuff in his way. He doesn't want to listen, so why am I going to try to help him? He doesn't want to listen to me, you know. And he can't get to where he needs to get to because all these things are in his way. And he has none of the tools and none of the preparation that he needs to make it over. So, all of you should have your papers by now. I'm going to kind of move through this. Most of these stories you guys already know. The first paper I want you to get out and look at is, which generation are you? Which generation are you? And there are a few Bible characters that I'm going to talk about. And you guys are going to help me. I know I have a lot of Bible scholars in the house, young Bible scholars. So the first one we're going to talk about, the first generation we're going to talk about, we're going to compare all of these generations, is Joshua. So we have Joshua's chosen generation here. Let me hear you. Okay. Who was Joshua? Have any volunteers? Who wants to tell me who Joshua was? A little bit about him. The baby said, hey, y'all, don't let the baby show y'all up. Y'all the Joshua's generation. I know y'all know. Who would like to? Kiana. Now, 
she hears Grandmama saying this stuff, and Grandmama starts teaching her about the Bible, God, uh, and she starts teaching her about the ways of God. So, what's your name, Steve? Nicole. Nicole here. She doesn't, she, she knows God, but she hadn't seen the same thing Grandma has seen. Grandma has seen some things. But, Grandma was telling her about it, so Nicole didn't experience it, but she heard it, and she learned it, so that second generation, they learned, they, they learned about God, but they, it was second-hand knowledge. That's like when you hear about a miracle, but you want to be the one, let me be the one, I need a miracle. But you know what? God did it for them, they can do it for you, he can do it for you, but you're hearing about it. It's second-hand. It's not your experience, it's someone else's. But it did help them. But they weren't quite as radical as Joshua. Remember, they were radical. They're like, okay, we love God, second generation. We, we love God, he's good, he's good. Okay, but we'll go to church, it's okay. All right, I may not go this Sunday, but I'm gonna go next Sunday, I love God. You know, I didn't read my Bible for a while. Where is that? Where did I put it? Oh yeah, you know, I'm going to read it today, though. I'm going to read it today. I might not read it the rest of the week, but I'm going to give you a little bit of hand, you know. Or, uh, oh, I haven't prayed in a long time. But you know what? I did say my grace. That counts, right? <laughs> Y'all know it's true. Stop looking at me like that. <laughs> so that was the second generation. So then we got the generation after that. How many of y'all remember Samson? And Kylie, you were doing a study on Deborah. Yeah. Who was Samson? Who was Deborah? But what, who was she? Samson. She was. What else? What about Samson? Judge. They were judges. So after them came the judges, but here was the problem with the judges. Now, we all know about the story of Samson, he had long hair, and that was where his strength came from, and he got caught up in a nice looking young lady who deceived him, cut his hair, you know. But I'm gonna read a little bit about the judges. So this is the third generation, and we're gonna kind of compare them, then we're gonna do another demonstration. So, and also all that, all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, but they did not know God, nor what he had done for Israel. So this next generation after the elders, they just don't know, don't know anything. They're like, I'm not going to church, I don't believe in God. I don't care, pray, why, God doesn't hear me, what has he done for me, I, I don't know, who is this guy? So they, one thing about that generation as I was reading and studying, is that a trait of that generation, they, they, yes they don't have a heart for God, but they also rejected a lot of wise counsel, so when, as Nicole was listening to her grandmother. This next generation don't want to listen. Don't want to listen to anybody. Grandma? Talk. Oh. That's just that old crazy Bible stuff she be talking about. Whatever. So, those are the three generations, and I'm going to just kind of uh, wrap this section up. Another comparison that I saw with the three generations, so we got one that served God, one, one that owned the torch, like one that went and took the torch, <laughs> and then ran with it. And then you have the second generation, they were like, hmm, do I want to carry the torch? I mean, I could, but I'm, it might burn my hand. I don't know. I, I carry it for a little while. They're a little more casual, right? And that next generation, oh, I'm just going to watch them do what they can do it. I mean, you know, I'm just going to look. And one other example I want to give with this, and we're going to wrap this session up and go to the little uh, next activity we're going to do. But 
got to thinking, it was like, we got a lot of those in the Bible, just the generation. So you got David, and we know David was the man after God's own heart. He loved God. He messed up, he repented, he was sincere about it. He loved God, he wanted to be do right by God. He wanted to build a temple to reverence God. And then he had his children. And his children had some drama. Drama. Yes. Ooh. Now I'm gonna only talk about one of them. I'll just talk about Solomon. Okay? Solomon's known for being what? Wise. There you go. Wise. So Solomon's known for being wise. So he listens. He listens. But Solomon, one of his issues, Solomon had a lot of wives. Did y'all know that? Yeah. He had a lot of wives. They were from everywhere. Sure did. Yeah. He was the first player. First player. First player. Player number one. Yeah. First player. He had so many wives. They were from everywhere. They were from all these different areas and cultures. And they gained influence with Solomon. So even though he was wise, and even though he loved God, when all those other people got access with all these other gods, that chipped away at his commitment to Jehovah, the one true God, the God of Israel, it chipped away. So Solomon just kind of was half-hearted and drifted away. He was wise. He even built the temple that his dad was planning to build. He built it. But then, you know, we have three generations. After Solomon comes the third generation. I'm going to try to say this name right. Rehol Boam. Rehol Boam. Okay? That was, yeah, yeah. That's what it is. <laughs> that, was, that one right there. That was Solomon's son. So, if Solomon was half committed, half hearted, what do you think happened to his son? No commitment? No heart? He gave up? He what? Oh, no soul. Ooh, that's deep. She said anything, like anything goes. No faith in anything. Ooh, y'all are deep. <laughs> no faith in anything. So each generation affects another generation. So, you know, every generation complains about every generation too. Like, and it's, it's going, it will happen to you as you get older and the kids come behind you, you're going to complain about them. Dang, those kids, nowadays, what's wrong with them? Right. They're just crazy. They just say all types of stuff. It's a cycle, don't worry. You, you'll be doing it soon, too. <laughs> but each generation affects another generation. But I did find some people that where, where the transition was maintained. It didn't go from best to eh, to oh Lord help us. It didn't go that direction. It went to oh that's good to oh man look out here they come. So with each generation that you know there's some places where in the Bible where we see and in life where we see it going backwards. Each generation's getting worse. The next one, oh Lord, what are they going to look like? Oh God, I can't even imagine what this next one's going to look like. But it should be going the other way. Right. Right? We're supposed to be making each other better. Each generation is supposed to get better. Right. If I start off poor, my daughter's not supposed to be even more poor. That's not supposed to happen. If I'm poor, my daughter should be well to do. If I'm wealthy, wealthy, my daughter should have it going on. She should, I think, I heard something about Kylie Jenner is a, bill, is a billionaire. I think I heard that on the news. I said, oh, is she making that type of money? I didn't know that. <laughs> but that's an interesting example. Her mom and family's well to do. We all know that story, so we ain't got to get into the Kardashians. That, that might not be a good subject. <laughs> Do it. But each generation is supposed to get better and better. So, I want to talk about how, the, how can you be a 
generation only the tour. So I need my five volunteers to come back.
Because that's, a, that's something special. You have to protect your influence. Because if you don't, you try to be a leader without in, any influence. You're not a leader. What's a leader look like with nobody following him? I'm like, okay, y'all follow me. Oh, no. You have to lead. That means there has to be someone following you, right? Yeah. So if you don't have any influence, you think they're going to listen to you? No. Okay. So, Moses and Joshua, we already talked about that story, but um, one thing that I really love about this story is that, you know, when Moses um, was watching some of the battles, Joshua was right there with him. He, it was his right hand man. Couldn't separate them. They were like this. Right hand man. And Moses would talk to Joshua. He would teach Joshua. He would tell him all the things he needed to know. Why? Because he was preparing him. So when someone wants to, like a, a teacher or a pastor, Sometimes they see something in you, or God gives them something about you, and they want to prepare you. Sometimes you think they're picking on you. You ever have a teacher? You say, ooh, she just don't like me. Yeah, all been there. Ooh, she just, ooh, why is she always talking, saying something to me? It's like she's just picking on me all the time. Now, sometimes you may have some teachers that do that, but sometimes... They're doing that because they recognize something in you. They're trying to push you, push you to be better. I have, um, I, I accepted a, a position at my job, and it's similar to what I was doing before. I um, was at this job, I was doing a lot of things, then I left, and then I came back. When I came back, it's under new management, and that's really what I was looking for. That's why I came back. I was like, ooh, okay, Lord God, just send the people to me um, who can help develop me. And I'm gonna be honest with you, he might, uh, you, all, you all might see him come here. Because we've talked about him coming, visiting the church. But when I tell you he was mean, he was mean, he was, he was nice, kind of. And I guess he came from a good place, but he was mean. He would just come over here, why is this like that? This shouldn't be like this. Uh-uh, you need to do this different. What is this? No, no, I, you should have it like this. This doesn't look presentable. What? Uh, so you know what? Each time, I was like, oh, man, I got to get it together. Fix this. This should look like this. Okay. So every day, I started coming in, getting stuff together. I said, no, it's got to look right. It's got to be right. This, this, this represents my work. Okay. He's going to look at this, and then so... After a certain amount of time, at first I thought maybe he didn't like me that much. But over time, he said, Chanel, I'm going to be honest with you. I, because it's a, it's a leader, a management position, and I look very young. I'm older than I look. But he said, I wasn't sure about you in this position. Um, and you just seem very young, and I just wasn't sure, but he said, you know what, you are, one, you, are, you are awesome at this job, and I think you're probably one of the most competent, com competent, skilled people I've ever met in this field. Then he said to me, he said, I was being very hard on you before, but I was testing you. One day he was yelling at me for no reason, that didn't make any sense, it was illogical, it, it was like, but you know what I did, I sat there, said, okay, okay, they'll get done. Okay. It was something that wasn't my fault, didn't have really anything to do with me, I thought he was just in a bad mood, but he said to me, he said, Chanel, remember that day when I was just yelling at you? And he said, I felt very bad, bad afterwards because I was testing you. He said, um, he said, you're going to go very far, and I'm going to help you get there. Um, he, he said, I was testing you to see how you react when something's done unfair to you. He said, you didn't talk back. You didn't make excuses. You didn't try to fuss and argue with me. You just did it, and you did your work. And every time, you came with a good attitude. You didn't come with the attitude because you 
were mad at me. You didn't come rolling your eyes. You didn't make excuses. You just did what you needed to do. You came, smiled at everyone, treated everyone the same, treated me the same, still treated me nice, even though I was being mean to you. And he went and he told some directors. He, and so in one month, I got a promotion. Because people are watching you. Just like people were, I knew people were watching me. People were going to, people, because he would yell at me in front of other people on purpose. Uh -huh. Cause, yeah, because that's how people see what you're made of. <laughs> so he was testing me, he was poking me. And so I knew I had to be very careful on how I reacted because I'm a leader, I'm a kingdom example. Right. So I had to, even though he was yelling at me for something that, I think they were like, huh? That doesn't make any sense. But I didn't say anything. I said, okay. Yes. All right. Okay. I'll get it done. He said, from that day forward, he said, I was like this. She's going to do great things is what he keeps telling me. Um, and now we are thick as thieves. And you'll probably see him come to church with his family next month. But yeah. I'm, giving, I'm just kind of giving that testimony because... How you react to these things? People are watching you. People are watching you every day. People are watching you. You don't even know it. But you're not doing things because people are watching you. You got to get to the place where you're doing it because it's right. Character and, and integrity is doing what is right regardless of who's watching. Who's watching? It doesn't matter. I remember Pastor Jay. She, uh, on, I think it was two weeks ago. In her sermon, she talked about um, uh, uh, was it Rebecca, I believe, and how she was at the well, and she gave water to the traveler and the camels, and how much work that took. She had to take all these gallons of water back and forth. Probably took her all day to water the camels. But she didn't do it because it was someone special. She didn't know who this person was. She didn't know that God had sent this person to be, that, that was going to actually bless her. She was doing it because that's what she did. She did that every day. Everyone else may have done the minimum, but she went over and above consistently every day. So I'm saying that to say that you have to be committed to becoming better. You have to be committed because the next generation coming after you, you're going to set the tone for that. You and so what the world is going to look like is going to depend on what we teach you all and what you all teach them and what you all teach the next one and so forth and so forth. So one thing with Joshua is uh, Joshua recognized and submitted to authority. And you cannot, just with the demonstration, RJ number one, RJ 1.0, remember he didn't listen. He don't want to be told anything. You say something to him, he probably talks back, rolls his eyes and says, shh, I ain't going to do it. <laughs> his daddy said, well, be the butt. <laughs> but RJ 2.0, he said, okay, if you give me a correction, I'll listen to it. If you say, okay, you should do this differently, I'm going to listen to you because you're, you're the person guiding me. You're my elder. And guess what? If his daddy told him to do something, beat his butt. If you don't, I know. I'm going to do it. <laughs> He's going to do it. So submissiveness, obedience, embracing the negative feedback instead of not wanting to hear anyone say anything. When someone tries to correct you, you always have a bunch of words for them. And a lot of times if we just trust the people, uh, uh, raise your hand if you feel like God has called one person into your life to be uh, a guide or a mentor. That's very special. That's such a special relationship. How many times do we actually listen to them when they tell you something? Yeah, yeah. Keith, don't try it. Don't, don't, don't make me revisit last Saturday. Oh. 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 Keith, he got real quiet, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> but how many, if we say we, oh, we know. 
no, God has put this person in my life. Oh, God put Pastor Jay in my life. Oh, I love her so much. She helps me so much. And then when she tells you something that you may not want to hear or that you're doing wrong, you're like, that ain't even going to work. I don't even care. I'm going to do what I want to do. She, 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 she just don't know. She just don't know what it's like. She don't understand. So I'm just going to do it this way. And okay, whatever happens, happens. And then most times the outcome's pretty bad. But another thing that Joshua had, they had a vision. They knew where they were going. They were supposed to possess the promised land. That was the goal. That was what God charged them with. So Joshua, so Moses died, and he passed that torch to Joshua, and Joshua was prepared. He had been submissive. He had listened to Moses when he spoke to him, and he knew and understand the vision. He knew where he was going. Give you another example. Mordecai and Esther. Who knows the story of Esther? How many of you guys know the story of Esther? Who wants to give me a very brief recap? Micah. <laughs> Let me get her around these other people. Let me get her around these other people and see how she acts. 
Let's see what she do then, uh, huh? She lead her, huh? Satan's testing you, and he's trying to give you, get you to give up that valuable item. Most times we give it away ourselves. People don't even take it. We're not guarding it like it's precious. We give it away. But you got to know how to hold on to it. So that was a, a trait of the generation owning the torch. They're disciplined. You know, the word disciple means disciplined ones. So if you're a disciple, you call yourself a disciple of Christ, you have to be what? What does it mean to be spiritually disciplined? Under control. In what area? Okay, what would that look like? If I said, I'm spiritually disciplined. I'm under control spiritually. Controlled by God. So that means you do what God tells you to do, right? So if he's, you know, prayer, we can't hear what God tells us what to do if we don't talk to him. It's a two-way conversation. We talk to him and he talks to us. So prayer, he may tell you to go on a fast. And some things you won't get through without fasting. That's what the Bible says. So the Bible, reading your word, studying your word, you don't know which, where you're going you don't know what tools you have until you know what God has, already, has instilled in you. And you find that out through the word of God. Amen. Amen. One last thing. So we got, let's recap. Mordecai and Esther, she was prepared. Mordecai prepared her. She was obedient. And she had influence. She had the ear of the king. She had the people to fast and pray. That gave her power to go into that throne room, and it gave her favor. So Esther was highly favored of the Lord because of that. So Naomi and Ruth, and this is the last one, and I'm going to wrap it up. So Naomi and Ruth, you know, uh, who, who wants to give me a recap of that? Who remembers that story? Treated her good. She was obedient. That's cool. 
And she was obedient when it was hard, too. But that obedience, you look at David. So there's some blessings in the generation when you are obedient. So I am wrapping up. But in my um, closing, I just want to say that you all have to recognize those things that are precious. And you have to guard them. You, have, you all saw how RJ was holding on to that phone. I told him it was a gold brick. He said, oh, this is a million dollars. I'm not letting anybody take this. That's how you have to hold on to the anointing God puts over your life. That's how you have to hold on and value your relationship with God. You have to protect it. It can't be more important than anything else. It is the most important thing you can ever have. When all else is gone, God is still there. Money will leave you. People may leave you. You may not be in the house you are in now. But one thing that we know for sure is God is still there with you. And if you have God, you can recover all that and more. So you don't even have to worry about what you lost. If you keep and guard that relationship with him, guard everything that he gives you. Because, you know, we don't want, you know, there's some people in the Bible who didn't guard it. And then they lost. You think of Saul. Saul. He was anointed king, right? But he was disobedient. And the Bible said the Spirit of the Lord left him, and he was tormented. He was tormented. He had no peace. He was going crazy because he was disobedient. He didn't protect and put God first. He didn't protect what God had given him. So that's what I want to leave you all with today is to value what God gives you and keep the vision. Know where you're going. And listen to the people God sends to help you. And that's one of the things I can say about, uh, that's a testimony in my life, is that God has sent people in my life, I know that it was ordained. So I had a rough childhood. But God put the people in my life to keep me and preserve me. So people, you know, wouldn't expect what I could tell them. But you know what? I don't even focus on that. I focused on what God gave me. And it was enough. And just knowing that God loved me that much to send those people into my life at that time, I guard those relationships. I guard the things he blessed me with. Because he used it for me to be able to make it. So guys, I want you to value, if you have a mentor here, or maybe they're at home, I want you to just think about those relationships you have with them. And think about, is this person really God called? Did this person really, is, there, is that the person who God really said, okay, I should listen to them. And then trust that God has your back. He's not going to send you the, uh, he's not going to cause that mentor to, to lead you astray. If all of the people who are over you are telling you, you need to be careful, you need to watch it, I want you guys to really take value in that. Okay? Y'all still love me? Okay? All right, guys, I think we are about to dismiss, and, or actually pray, right? And uh, I'll let Pastor Murray take it from here.